first person we have joining us is Jessica Scott, who is head of R&D patient engagement at Takeda. We have Lord Drayson, um, who is chief executive of Sensine Health. Eddie Martucci, who is co-founder and chief executive of Achille Interactive. Hanno Ronte, a partner at Deloitte. And Dan Vadat, uh, who is uh, the founder of Meadowpad. Uh, thanks so much, all of you, for, for being with us today. Um, we'd like to start with our, our, our first sort of proper polling question, uh, which hopefully is, uh, is coming up. Oh, yes. Um, so we're asking which players in the industry are best placed to build strong and commercially beneficial relationships with patients? Is that the pharma industry, physicians and other healthcare workers, the tech industry or the insurance industry? Let's give that a couple of moments to settle down. as if, yes, I'm still moving around a bit, but I think by a reasonably solid margin, it's physicians and other healthcare workers. Um, I'd be interested in all your thoughts, actually, on, on, on that. I mean, could, could I start with you, Jessica? How does that strike you? People seem to, people in our audience seem to think that it's physicians and healthcare workers, who I guess traditionally have always had that most direct relationship with patients, but I guess the, 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 the challenge or the interest now is in whether that's starting to change and whether other players in the system are developing their own strong relationships with patients. How, how do you feel from a pharma company perspective, uh, to, to, to start with you, put you on the spot first, about that? Uh, do, do you think you can now sort of really compete for the... The, the, the loyalty of patients, the data of patients? Uh, how, how do you see that relationship changing and shifting? Yeah. I think it's changing quite a bit, actually. Um, and we are getting closer to direct interactions with patients. Mm -hmm. In my role at Takeda, my job is to really bring that patient into R&D so that we're developing medicines with patients rather than just for patients. Mm -hmm. And in that way, we're really baking in the patient perspective into our drug development programs. And in the end, it will mean more medicines of value to patients and, and more medicines of value to sponsors who can really understand from the patient perspective what are the true unmet needs. It's, it's that two-way dialogue that we define patient engagement at, in R&D at Decada that helps us understa understand and really discover the unmet needs, the patient perspective that will allow us to ultimately generate these insights and, and better medicines in the end. But we've got to establish that connection, and that's novel. That's really new, and we're doing that. Because I suppose the industry in the past has been perhaps a little nervous about the, the regulatory environment around connecting too closely and directly with, with patients. So that's something to be overcome, I guess, in, in a way, a different way of it, thinking. Yes, it's something to be overcome. And I think we were nervous as an industry because we were prevented from regulation, from direct communication, that we've had to sort out. Increasingly, the expectations from the patient community are that we need to interact. So we've had to figure out a way to do that, and that's led to innovative uh, engagement ad boards, ad hoc members of study teams, so that we can have that direct interaction despite our heavily regulated environment. Great, and Dan, can I come to, to, to you on that? And could you also say a little about Medevad, actually, in terms of what you, uh, what you do? Sure, definitely. Uh, I guess in terms of what we do, we have this very simplistic view on history of medicine, which started with doctor visits and then expanded to pathology 500 years ago and 100 years ago radiology, and most recently we have genomics as the latest category in medicine. And recently a new category has evolved, which is based on 
the data that you can capture with technologies like this, like this, or the way you talk, the way you walk. And we call them digital biomarkers, which is ultimately a combination of few data points that correlates to progression of your disease or potentially screening for a disease similar to the work we are doing with Tencent for Parkinson's or the partnership we have done with Janssen to be able to tell about Alzheimer, whether you have Alzheimer based on your voice. Uh, and we think the quantification of the disease is a very important part of building any digital tool. Because if you just have an app, it's not going to do anything. And that quantification of the disease comes from these digital biomarkers, which can also have applications for drug discovery and other stuff, which is not our specialty. But this is very also relevant to the question, which is the relationship with the patient. Relationship is a two-way. And the reasons doctors and nurses has been relatively successful in that building the relationship was because you go to them, talk to them, you get something, you give something. No other part of the medicine traditionally had that, pharma, insurance, and others. And we think technology companies have a role here to bring everyone together. And I think the relationship has to be owned by everyone. And a group of companies needs to come and create an ecosystem that the patient has a relationship with the ecosystem. It's not about the hospitals, it's not about the pharma, it's not about the tech or payers. It's about us collectively building something that when patients need something, they can get it quickly. And it's like a boost way relationship. Yes, but very patient-centric. Exactly. And again, to be able to quantify their disease and tell them where they are, how they are doing, why a technology that can be real time, it is where you get a lot of engagements. Because traditionally, medicine has been built based on periodic data. Genomics is the periodic data, imaging is periodic data. Digital biomarkers and technologies on devices like this can be real time. And relationships, you want to have real time relationship most of the time. Which has certainly never happened <coughs> before in the long history of, uh, of medicine that you've just outlined. Yes, yes it's, um, it, it wasn't possible it, because technology yes. wasn't there five years ago, ten yes, years ago. Even as recently as five years ago, yes. Um, Lord Drayson, could I come to, to you? I mean, your company's model is all about returning benefit to the NHS and thus to patients. But I wondered what you thought about this, this question of sort of, as I say, we phrased it slightly provocatively, who owns the patient, but through the lens of, of your company, and again, perhaps you could explain a little, a, sure, a little more sure. about it yeah. um, for anybody who's not fully familiar with it. Um, but sure. just wondered what you made of this. So this I think the, the answer to your question is, is the patient owns the, the, the patient. <laughs> because I think, think of the patient as a, as a member of the, the general public. We're all aware of how society is being changed by data-driven new business models. Mm -hmm. Um, increasing, increasing awareness of how artificial intelligence and machine learning approaches to analysing that data are offering lots of new services and changes to society. The public's aware that not all of those changes are good changes. And so therefore there is a very important question going on um, in society as to how society is changed by technology and how businesses, whether that's the pharmaceutical industry or finance, social media, how that changes in a way which maintains the confidence of the public and therefore the confidence of society. Mm -hmm. So I think that as the pharmaceutical industry faces the challenge of, of making healthcare more affordable under global pressures on healthcare costs, it's clear that technology has a huge role to play. But it needs to be done in a way which maintains that trust and confidence within our society. And here, I think, the pharmaceutical industry has a huge advantage because it is established over more than 100 years based upon good regulation, confidence in the general public that things are done in the right way, that they can have confidence in how things are done on their behalf. I think you'll remember you know, 15 years ago, we went through a crisis in the industry where we lost people's confidence on animal testing for a while. And I think the issue of the use of patient data and real-world evidence in the industry is likened to that. We need to make sure that the way we do it is seen to be the right way, and that's why I believe the answer to your early, the, the question which you put up first 
is not the tech industry. It's an evolution of the pharmaceutical industry. Right. Building from the foundation around a regulated framework, evolving how the pharmaceutical industry uses technology in a way <coughs> to improve care and, and accelerate the development of new medicines. It's really interesting. I think we can come back perhaps later in the discussion to all the issues around trust and trust of, of the data particularly. Um, and that's a really interesting parallel with, 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 with animal testing because um, we have completely managed to sort of come through that. In the, yes. I, mean, I think the industry has, has really managed to put that behind it, because, hasn't it? Because the industry learned that, that by being silent about it, it lost the argument. And so when the industry started to engage and started to talk about why it was required by law and why these, these animal tests needed to be done to ensure medicines were safe and effective, it changed the debate and confidence in the public was restored, which is why it's important now for the pharma and biotech industry to engage and show how these, these tools can be used in an, in an effective, appropriate way, but also to recognise that new partnerships need to be established. So, if, for example, Sensine Health exists to provide a means for pharmaceutical companies to analyse anonymized patient data provided by the NHS, but in a way which is consistent with the values of the NHS and provides a financial return back to the NHS. It's those type of issues which are going to be really important to get right if this, this trust is to be maintained. Thanks so much. Eddie, can I come to you? Um, uh, perhaps you could explain a bit about Achille Interactive, again, for anybody in the audience who is not fully familiar with it, but also how you see your relationship with patients. Sure. Um, so we're a leading digital therapeutics company um, in the U.S. Um, and, and digital therapeutics, to throw one more jargon out there, the way we define that is software as medicine. Um, so this is actually software that is, as Dan said, highly quantitative in the patient's hands, but is actually deploying treatments. Um, and so we focus uh, mostly on what we see as one of the next um, evolutions of, of medical need, which is cognitive dysfunction. Uh, so neurology, neuropsychiatry, behavioral health. Um, and we deploy essentially what we call a total treatment solution, which are um, products in patients' hands that through sensory and motor stimulus um, can, can actually tap in and change physiology in the brain, um, and then supportive services around that. Um, that's the long explanation for sometimes people know us as the company that makes um, video games that could be treatments for you. Um, so we have a really, I think, interesting um, viewpoint of the world um, related to relationship. I love what Dan said. We're, we always talk about relationship with a capital R, which has to be two-way, has to be back and forth. Um, I would say we're entering an interesting phase where the answer to that first poll question, I can't remember if there was an other on the bottom. The um, because I think we... Else you'd add in. Yeah, yeah I, I may, maybe I agree with Lord Drayson that the, the kind of evolution of, and I'm not sure it's pharma, but the evolution of some industry, and I'd say a new industry, um, is probably what's needed here. Um, and the reason I say that is uh, you have these consumer trends over the last five to ten years of consumer knowledge, consumer empowerment, consumers driving here's what I want, here's what I don't want, and I'm getting stronger in that position. Um, and I think the one thing we haven't done yet in combining sort of the best of pharmaceutical and the best of technology um, is something that the technology industry for pure consumer products actually got right in the last 10 years, which is you can measure data, you can have great experiences, but when you use data to immediately provide value back to the patient, in the way that they're asking for it. That is the key to unlocking relationship. It's the key to unlocking loyalty. And it's the key to honestly giving patients something that in the moment and day over day, they feel like gains for them. So one thing we've been doing in the medical industry at large is collecting tons of data. And so we're asking these questions like, who owns the patient data? And what can we do with all this patient data? But if you put yourself in the, in the eyes of a patient, Sure, for themselves, for their family, altruistically, do they want to donate data for the evolution of better medicines? Of course. Um, but humans tend to want to work and do things when they can get direct value back out of that. So in the types of products we make, and I think you're seeing this evolving industry, certainly in the U.S., 
Um, but uh, there's, there's something we founded called the Digital Therapeutics Alliance, where there's now a few dozen companies, um, including pharma companies like, like Bayer and Novartis are part of. Um, and, and we're seeing that expand in the UK and in Asia. Um, we're seeing partnerships. We, we did a partnership with Shianogi, which is a very novel commercial partnership. Um, but what these types of products can do, digital therapeutics, is take in data from the patient and immediately adapt that product. So much more like a typical technology product that you come to love, yes. every moment and every bit of data that's coming in, the next experience you have is actually better. And so the product is improving over time, like almost in real time. Um, and that's something I don't think we've had in medicine. And I'm not sure that's something that, you know, is tech or pharma, I think it's, it's new. It's new. That, that data is almost sort of the point rather than the byproduct. Um, you, you know, that da data is, is, the, is, is what you're, you're promising. It's yeah, not just a, exactly. a I think we've, sort of we've, accidental um, byproduct. When I say we, I don't even mean the pharma industry. We clearly have a, a uh, I can't remember how Emma said it, we're um, <laughs> reputationally challenged. Yes. Um, that's not a pharma-specific thing, of course. Uh, we, up until a year ago, that you wouldn't have said that about the tech industry, and now you do. Uh -huh. Um, and so I think that's because we've been using this data exhaust, if you will, this data byproduct to try to monetize it in yes. different ways. Yes. Um, that's not aligned with the direct interest of the patient generally. It's, and we're seeing that in dramatic uh, failure fashion with you know, the kind of Facebook uh, issues in the world. Um, so when data is the point, um, that actually changes the dynamic. And so uh, I, I've been pushing in our industry in digital therapeutics to say the companies that will win are not the companies that have the very best product on day one, you know, that's locked as it is, and, and you know, whoever has the best product will win. It's who can most quickly respond to patient data, respond to patient needs, and increase their product, the efficacy, safety, um, and really the place in the patient's lives. Um, and so there, the data has to be the critical factor. Hanno, can I ask you finally to reflect on some of what you've heard? and. Uh does it resonate with, with you? I, I think it certainly resonates with our experience in the industry, and I think in some ways we've got three very good examples of three different business models that are interacting, well, actually four if you include clearly pharma as a, as a traditional player, but um, four different business models that interact with, with the patient data. And who, uh, and who owns the question, I agree with Lord Drayson, is it has to absolutely be the patient. But the question is, what is the, the license, if you like, and the permission to use that data? And that exists, and where does trust come from? And I think I, I agree with you, I think, Eddie, that it has to come from the individual patient experience. But what we're also seeing, as you've alluded to, is that a lot of the business models that interact with patients actually uh, generate data as a byproduct which can be used or misused. Um, and I think, uh, from our experience at least, the <clears throat> probably the biggest benefit you can get from data at the healthcare system is actually to optimize patients flowing down a pathway, because I think the highest cost in the system still is today, people actually not taking medicines or experiencing medical intervention in the way it is supposed to, where everybody, where everybody agrees is the optimal way of doing it. And I think if data can help to do that, I think it will make a huge, huge difference. But I think uh, maybe one aspect we haven't uh, talked about much is what is the responsibility of data owners to use data well? Um, because I do think that data gives you an opportunity and indeed an obligation to know things. Uh, and in particular, as we we're talking about digital biomarkers, you know, who has the responsibility to communicate those digital biomarkers um, to patients? And if I were to ask this audience, you know, if you could know with relative 60% certainty that you would have a heart attack or a significant cancer event, would you like to know? And typically, when we're not polling this, but my experience is that there are three groups of people. The people who say no, like me, I want to keel over and be dead. Um, others who say... Right now? Please, please not now, but I'm not sure there are some doctors in the room. Um, and then a third uh, will say, well, absolutely, definitely. And then the smart Alex in the middle will say, well, it depends. Um, and I think the depends is actually one of the biggest uh, questions that we have uh, in terms of creating systems that allow people to use data responsibly. And then the last questions, I do uh, agree with, with the panel here, that in the end, the data question will be about an ecosystem. There will not be one owner, um, because it's really difficult to monetize data per se, and I think we see a lot more bartering 
So I think we would wish a little bit more for data generosity and data responsibility. Really interesting. I mean, do you, do you think there are still sort of more new business models to come you know you, you, for, for the whole panel this question but you know you because you you mentioned Hannah we've got sort of three distinct ones here but is you know can can it you know can this fusion of of every sort of player in the the, the, the patient ecosystem as it were can can it produce even some different models different uh, I mean, certainly in our experience, very much so. I think even Deloitte is part of this ecosystem. We have products that do that. We do clinical trials. Who would have thought an accounting firm, professional services Amazing. firm, would ever do clinical trials? Um, and I think these things are happening. And I think this will not be the last panel where we discuss new disruptive business models um, that will deliver yes. better therapeutics and better medicines. I, yeah. I think there's an opportunity. I love what you said, that we have a responsibility to know. And I would add an appendage onto that, that we also have an opportunity and a responsibility to learn. Yes. Right? And those are slightly different things. Um, I think a lot of these new models, and we represent a few of them up here, um, are going to market or trying to scale to market or building businesses. Um, I think we need to go beyond the innovation being just in the technology. Everyone's like focusing on their, their um, sort of one instantiation of technology, learning what they can about that, perfecting it, quote unquote, and then putting it out there. I think we have to take the same approach to business model. So I think we need to go out and instead of people you know, sitting in data, new data driven and tech industries and say, this is the business model that will reign supreme. No, this is the business model that will reign supreme. Um, I think as we scale and really uniquely in this model where, as I was talking about, you can collect data, learn from patients directly, I think it's going to influence the business model itself. Um, and I would say, um, we don't know, and I'll just take our example, like digital therapeutics in patients' hands to treat disease in a new way. I'm not sure we know um, exactly what that business model will look like. I think it heavily depends on the dynamics of interacting with patients as you scale. Jessica, you wanted to comment. Yeah, I wanted to comment that um, I, I think it comes down to trust and collaboration. The pharmaceutical industry has reputationally declined in the past couple decades, and it's only the pharmaceutical industry that can rebuild that trust <laughs> with patients. And we talk about the data and who owns it, but as an industry, I believe that we have to return the data from clinical trials to patients because it's about the autonomy, not just the, the ownership question. If patients have their data, it can impact their healthcare decision making downstream. Also, they can contribute their data to further advanced science outside of the clinical trial. They've got their data, they can use it in multiple ways. So let's not leave the patient out of this, this mix because they're an important stakeholder to, to pull right into the collaboration. I think that's an important point. I think the, the evolution of business models need, needs to reflect that we're moving from a sort of a transactional basis, a fundamental transactional basis within the industry, to more of a recognition that it needs to be a partnership. As we depend more and more on the ability to access data and develop algorithms based upon the best data, it is a fact that the best data sets are often in the public sector, which are funded by taxpayers under the current system here in the, in the UK. So how do you properly reflect that, that investment and that value? The only way to do it is to come up with a new type of partnership model. I think if that can be established, then we can start to look at issues around outcomes-based pricing at the other end of the system, as well as in the, in the beginning, in the development of, of new products. You can close that loop then you have the prospect of being able to make healthcare of a higher standard more affordable for society. And just to follow up on that, it's on the industry to figure out how to return data back to patients. This doesn't happen now. We're highly regulated. I was on a panel with FDA and patients talking about the return of individual data and results. And the patient on the panel said, just do it already, <laughs> right? But we actually need to figure out, and there's a small handful of pharmaceutical companies, six, that are thinking about what's the playbook? It's not the technology. It's how do we navigate this complex space? How do we return it and when so that we don't interfere with the study integrity, for example? 
So it's working collaboratively with patients and with technology companies and with regulators to figure out how to do something new and different, right? To give patients back their control of their data so that there is this reciprocal relationship between uh, those of us who are running the trial and those who are participating. Because so often participants don't even ever find out they don't. Yeah. You know whether it worked or not, and we need to but, change but, but I think that. it yes. goes beyond that. I think typically a lot of the, if you focus on the R and D side of pharma, a lot of the trials are driven by scientific and clinical principles. But actually, often we are finding, in particular, some of the oncology treatments. Now, actually, it's about the quality of life that patients mm -hmm. are interested in. And I think if we would give patients more voice in what good clinical endpoints are, I think yes. we would find that we will actually have to measure different things, which we maybe traditionally would never have managed, so we uh, need measured to, or could have measured. That's yes. right. So we need to bring regulators along because they're not typically interested that's in right. quality of life. But won't they have to be going forward? Because the FDA has now mandated patient reported outcome data to be part of um, drug approval submissions. But I would it? say they're still struggling a little bit with yeah. coming to terms with, and what, what a wonderful thing to have one evidence generation plan for you know, co mm. in the commercial payer space and also the regulatory so that we have a seamless uh, pathway that meets patients' needs. And I think we may be getting to a tipping point where that voice that you said, which we hear all the time, like just do this already, mm. right? Just give <laughs> me what is obvious already. Um, they're, they're done waiting, yeah. right? And they're fed up with it. So I love the, the phrase that you used, um, transactional, right? To move beyond transactional. Um, I think what, at a, at a kind of like deep emotional or esoteric or however you'd want to define it, um, point for patients, there's a, there's a reaction to the paternalism of medicine, mm -hmm. right? For medicine coming to them and saying, we know what's good for you or you're gonna do this and we may or may not tell you the results, it depends on what it says and if it's good for you or not. Um, I think that's the type of thing that maybe even a lot of patients can't voice, but that patients, or I'd say consumers, right, consumers who have needs, um, are, are done with, whether they can voice it or not. And so I love that example of, you know, ask the patient what they want, ask the consumer what they want. They're gonna tell you and it's many times gonna be different. Um, if our systems, for the, you know, the way medicine is built today, which includes regulatory, it includes data sharing. If we can't catch up quick enough, uh, patients are gonna move on, right? They're, they're so close, and I'm not saying they're moving on from the pharmaceutical or the tech industry. Uh, people need these products. Um, but psychologically, like, we don't wanna get to a point of no return. Um, and so it's time for us to, I think, digital therapeutics industry is doing the same thing from a different angle in uh, regulatory and otherwise, is just to force the issue. Right, and to force change because it's the right thing to do for patients today. How much of a challenge is all of this for, for doctors, though? Because are we talking about really needing to shift, you know, the old cliche to move from a sickness to a wellness service? But I think that is quite challenging to the way most doctors have been brought up to practice medicine, isn't it? And, you know, the sort of the difficulties of moving to a population health approach, which Stefan talked about on, on the last panel, you know, perhaps payers not being very incentivized to, to do that. So there could be some real challenges here to physicians and to payers. I, th I to think there are the huge system. challenges, also because I think we've talked about data as if uh, to enable how we do things today. But I actually think data will change fundamentally what we do mm. today. Uh, and I think already, I mean, I think we have this sort of impression that doctors are gods in white and maybe they're becoming angels in white. And maybe in the future there will be administrators in white. Um, because, I mean, even if you look at airline pilots, et cetera, there are a lot of other industries where actually the standardization is such that you will, you know, you don't want to have to ask who's the doctor treating you. You want, just like you don't want to fly, ask who's flying me to New York. So you want to be sure that it's the same outcome. Yes. So there, I think that we will see a huge, huge shift um, in that mentality of what that is. And I think in the end, it will <coughs> enable population-based um, relationships, also with industry, with innovation. Um, and in the end, I think, you know, we were talking about this earlier, is will you end up in a world where actually doctors get paid um, to keep patients healthy as opposed to treating people who are yes. sick? Paid on outcomes. Okay. Yes. Well, um, the current system is pretty yes. unsustainable, so it has to change, and having been in medical practice and primary care, 
I think that physicians would welcome these technologies and these, way, these changes so that they are more efficient with how they spend their time and it makes more sense in terms of the outcomes for their patients. Uh, and this is a model that, you know, in line with business model, quite unique in the U.S. now. We as a company have like three reimbursement codes, mm -hmm. which actually pays initially the doctor $60 per patient per month to look at the patients for 10, 20 minutes, their data, and they don't even need to do it themselves. It has become so standardized that a nurse can do that part for them. And then suddenly, not only the clinics now have a new uh, revenue generation, which is kind of a SaaS model, which is great, I think, because everyone loves SaaS. Uh, but also from the patient perspective, you have these continuous engagements of like a monthly, somebody looking after a bunch of your vital signs, and then here you have a platforms to bring all these predictive algorithms. If your blood pressure goes up and this happened and that happened, maybe a flag for this, and maybe a flag for that. And suddenly that platform can also be used to deploy digital medicines and digital therapeutics because the relationship has moved and become digital. And digital is a great thing because every one of us carry one of these. Even to an extent that now, Governments are looking, we have now one of the countries coming to us and saying, what if when you guys are ready with your Alzheimer digital biomarker, which we are developing with Janssen, screen everyone from age 65 above for Alzheimer. The same way that, for instance, we do breast cancer screening in the UK, NHS was a, one of the leaders uh, within the healthcare space in that. What if we can screen patients for Parkinson? on the back of the work we are doing with Tencent. And, and that is new, never existed before. You can screen a nation and then bring all the innovations that Paul and his team are working on, all the innovations that uh, pharma companies are working on in a more accessible way to everyone. But that is a big challenge to, to health systems, I think. You may actually worry about the cost of that. Mm -hmm. You know, the way health systems often uh, are thinking sort of in annual budgets and not over the course, you know, something like that, which would unquestionably save money over 10 or 20 years, but will have a, an in-year cost. I think there's still a, a way in which health systems really sort of grapple with the health yeah. economics around that. I think without it when, it, when we're so far from personalized medicine, which we are today, then you do incur these huge costs and, and an 18 month purview from a payer, um, especially a private payer, but even governments, like it's, you can't get your hands around that. And so the two things we've been lacking, I think, are options, uh, better treatment options, but also the data to know if that's working. So I think what you're going to see is that with, if you just have more treatment options, um, then it's, it's a mess, right, without data. <laughs> you have more treatment options, doc, it's kind of willy-nilly, you try to guess what's best for patients, it's a mess. But if you have data, especially closer we get to real-time data, I think what you'll see, um, and we you know, have modeled this out a bit, is that you can do things like um, reduce the number of office visits early on when trying to find the most successful treatment. We see this all the time in neuropsychiatry, um, in behavioral and mental health, that it can take four, five, six office visits, multiple um, pharmaceutical treatments, multiple non-pharmaceutical, and then at the end, generally a combination in polypharma to get something that's right, uh, that can be so much better. So to have, to have more options earlier on, I actually think it feels like, okay, it might be a heavier investment up front, but I think what we're gonna learn is in the earliest phase of treatment courses, we're gonna be able to narrow in those treatments for any one patient, what's most likely to be more effective for you quicker, and that actually saves money, not in the long term, not five years out. That could save money in the first year. And so it's these really coarse things like office visits, like discontinuation or, or lack of compliance with medication. Many times it's because of it's either side effects. Well, there's human behaviors too, but also side effects and efficacy. And so if you can dial those in even a little bit better, you start to actually reduce that variance in the first year. And I think costs actually do go down. Yeah, and but this, this point about costs, though, I think is, is, is central to the, the political context of this. We're in, you know, just about to go into a general election here in the United Kingdom, and the NHS is going to be front and center in that. The, the opportunity, I think, is to have a, a, a debate about how healthcare can be delivered 
in an affordable manner to society by being able to combine effectively these digital tools with, with therapeutics. It's, it's very difficult politically when you have a situation where new medicines for treatment, uh, cancer for example, are not afforded by a system because those medicines are so expensive. And being able to show how investment in these digital tools alongside the, the traditional pharmaceutical development process can reduce the cost of development by being able to better design clinical trials, the, the sort of work that we're doing with, with Bayer in, in cardiovascular disease, but also to be able to have a better ability to segment patient populations, to be able to show that by giving the right drug to the right patient, it does make sense to use a more expensive drug in the wider context of the overall healthcare cost. And those arguments have got to be made and won to enable healthcare systems to be able to adopt the technologies which are now being, being, being made available through the, the, the new innovations which now exist. And, and to echo that, you know, yes, when you start screening and being proactive, it costs a little bit of money. But what is the most expensive part of any disease? Complications. Unpredictable. They end up like starting their area of like different uh, things going wrong in your body. If you can find the cancer patients early, it's a really quick and cheap treatment. But also, more importantly, you're going to have somebody that's going to have their life back, meaning that they can contribute back to the society. Same goes for cardiovascular. The work that Paul is doing with Bayer, as well as the big partnership we did with Bayer around cardiovascular to develop digital biomarker and digital medicines, exactly the same. We think uh, you can bring a lot of savings from the healthcare delivery side because we are proactive. We can optimize within digital, with digital tools, a lot of discovery of drugs, and so that the cost of that is less. The reason some of the drugs are expensive is just because it costs. And they have to pay their bills, so they have to charge people, and somebody has to pay, and at the end, patients are paying some one way or the other. And it's a lot of efficiencies we can bring. US, 50% inefficient, the whole healthcare. More than 50%, in fact. What if we can save at least 10% of that 50%? And we think there's a big opportunity and we shouldn't be aware of a little bit of investment because digital tools and technology is cheap. But, but I think that to me, I think, is also one of the uh, opportunities which we haven't really talked about is what, who actually managed the regulatory system that governs you know, how everybody around the sofa is actually engaging with the system. And I think, you know, if I look at Germany now with the Digital Care Act, is really trying to create interoperability between healthcare records, is favoring digital therapeutics, et cetera, but trying to create a different uh, environment. And even if you think about on the R&D side, uh, what the FDA has done with the real-time oncology pathway, you know, which has created approvals within two weeks. I mean, you have to imagine that. Two weeks to get a phase three drug approved uh, for marketing. It's unheard of. Um, and that also questions, you know, based on the data, very much like you were saying, it actually questions um, what is our clinical approvals process? Data allows us, digital data, real-time data, allows us to think about clinical development in a very, very different way. Because of the ready availability of real-world evidence which will Correct. show how that drug is working once it's out in, in regular use, which gives a degree of sort of double security, Correct. I suppose. Correct. Still, our patients are our partners, and if we don't enroll them in clinical trials and retain them by being more collaborative, we won't be able to get drugs Correct. to market. So Correct. it's really important to keep bringing that patient into this discussion and making sure that we're focusing on what happens before commercialization in R&D to show the value and to understand what that value is from a patient perspective. Incidentally, you know, you talked about bringing the patient voice in. Have you actually put some different endpoints in some of your trials? Uh, yes. Because you've listened to patients yes, and, and they've changed your mind about what you were originally, or your scientists were originally yes. planning to focus on. Yeah, that's a great question. Let me give you a specific example. Yeah. In Friedrich's ataxia, we had originally the six-minute walk test as our primary outcome measure. 
And it turns out that patients who are part of our study team, ad hoc members of our study team, said that that isn't what matters to us. We care more about fine motor skills and coordination. And we'd rather have some endpoint that really helps us understand, mm -hmm. is this medicine going to help with, with that? Mm -hmm. And so what we did was we called the FDA and said that we'd like to use actually a different outcome measure, the nine-hole peg test, which is used in MS. And we didn't get the acceptance that we wanted first off. But because of working with patients and also the patient community, the patient organization, FARA, actually held a, a, um, a patient-focused drug development meeting, invited the FDA. The FDA heard what patients were saying and then followed up on a conversation and said, well, yes, okay, that makes sense. We get it now. Go ahead and change it to the nine-hole peg test. But it was a bit of a learning experience was, for the right. regulator. A exactly. Yeah. And, and so increasingly advocating for the patient needs and interests with our interactions with regulators will also help to build this trust and increase collaboration. Very valid point on these digital endpoints because if the drug you know, is like a car taking you from A to B, if you have a car that just like shakes so much, you're gonna get sick when you get to B still. You still get to the point B, which is a probably healthier place, but the experience is horrible. I suppose as a good driver that drives very smoothly and avoids all the bumps and all the good stuff. And that you can only capture if you bring, this is a great example that I just heard, uh, these kind of technologies into hand of patients. And another example that might be helpful for all of us to think about is really early on, even in discovery, bringing the patient perspective in to know not what we could do, but what we should do. Mm -hmm. So we had in our discovery unit a project team that was very interested in um, GI symptoms as related to either spinal cord injury or Parkinson's disease. And from the physician's lens and the healthcare community and the medical literature, there was not all that much of an unmet need. We had an ad board, invited patients, they sat there with the project team and had a two-way dialogue. And the incredible difference when hearing directly from patients right, was that there's such an unmet need that these patients with spinal cord injury said that they would rather have these symptoms addressed than to be able to walk again. Really? Day two, we had an ad board with Parkinson's disease asking the same questions and not so much of an unmet need there. But that's the value of the two-way dialogue in R and D. Fantastic, interesting. Any other thoughts on the panel? Um, I think the good thing is we're seeing this with the groups that pay for medicine now. I mean, more and more we're seeing um, insurance companies or, or um, government bodies that are actually paying for the care of medicine, taking into account patient experience, taking into account, um, I, I guess, global patient satisfaction along with the endpoints, because I think where, where the world still is today, but certainly was anchored in, was that these standard clinical endpoints, which took decades to, you know, quote unquote, validate, um, that must be what patients care about, right? But I think um, there's this recognition that overall patient satisfaction is actually the most important thing and that if we don't ask them, I love that example, I've never heard that, that pointed of an example before where something that on paper you'd say, of course that's what matters to patients, they wanna walk again, right? But you have to talk to people. So um, I love that there are other, be beyond the regulatory angle, there are other major stakeholders that tend to be either barriers or enablers that I think are, are thinking the same way. Um, I do think it's on the companies that are developing these uh, treatments and developing these technologies that sit in patients' hands that just have to push the agenda, though. We're not going to get there unless we, we keep showing examples like this and, and um, evangelizing for all these different stakeholders. Look how powerful this can be if you just, um, if you just open your mind and ask patients. But we have to bring the regulatory framework with us. I think that's really important. Yeah. Yeah. We are at, at a time when uh, computer science is moving at a speed driven by multiple industries, and as those techniques are starting to be used in the pharmaceutical industry, the regulatory framework has got to evolve to be able to maintain that confidence. That the, the, we need to, I think, recognize that the sort of uh, philosophy which is often applied within, within tech of minimally viable product, you know, move fast, break things, does not apply in healthcare. And, and we need to ensure that that confidence is based upon a regulatory framework which is fit for purpose mm -hmm. as innovation takes place. And we have a huge role to play to make sure that the regulators have the ability to do that. Very interesting.
interesting. Um, sorry, did you want to? No, I, I think I just, uh, I mean, from my, my rounding up of this is that I, I do think that, you know, digital provides a huge, huge opportunity. Um, for everybody and there's the sense of data both from an innovation side of pharma from a delivery but I think also from a healthcare system and I agree with Lord Drayson I think the regulatory framework needs to evolve and it's lagging a bit behind but I think we also need to you know going back to Jessica's point not forget that there is no such thing as the average patient you know even you know to that question that you asked there will be people who have different answers and I, f I find digital and data has the ability to be much more precise to the unit of one but I think scarily um, predictive of the average. And I think we as individual patients, you know, all in the room and all of us, have an obligation, I think, to interact with our data and with our healthcare system in a way that actually uh, makes our voices heard and makes the data useful. Right, and digital and AI has a role even in interactions with patients in R&D. So across Takeda, every study team now, we've built it into R&D in a structural way Every team must engage with patients and have a, a two-way dialogue across all of R&D. But how do we collect all the information that we're getting? We're going to use AI to tag and know what insights we're getting in what country and how that relates. And there's just an important um, connection there for digital, even in the space of human interaction. That's a good, really good point. Well, look, we've just got a little few minutes left uh, for questions. Um, uh, oh yes, we've got two gentlemen here. Uh, thank you so much for interesting discussion. Clearly you were missing a regulator, but thanks God I'm a regulator. <laughs> uh, I'm Thomas Enderovitz, I'm the head of the Danish Medicines Agency, and this is going to be a cliffhanger because tomorrow I'll be on the panel discussing some of the things you've just talked about. You clearly illustrated that you have tech coming from an unregulated part of the world into a very regulated part of the world of pharma. And a lot, many of your um, excellent ideas are a little bit far-fetched, yet screening a whole nation for Alzheimer or Parkinson without having the means to treat them will create a little bit of a challenge, I would assume. However, <laughs> uh, many things are already happening, uh, and many regulators are already thinking about the discussions you have and taking the steps to fix this. Uh, and the challenges that you are alluding to comes down to the fact that should we have more regulation of the tech coming into pharma or should we have less regulation? Clearly, I'm in favor of more regulation. You can't really live without regulation at all, can you? And in particular, the challenges we see from very, the very, very big um, tech companies. You mentioned the Facebook stuff. It's not just Facebook. Google has been stepping slightly outside good behavior, I would say doesn't seem to me that lack of regulation is going to fix this. Now, here to the questions to you guys. Have you done any outcome studies to actually demonstrate that all these brilliant new technologies actually benefit patients' real outcome studies? And when are we going to see them? Thank you. I think, if I may, regulation and working with regulatory bodies is the most important part of this world. And we are like one of the big champions. I think we were the first company, or one of the first that we got C approved, and then we are working with FDA and CFDA in China. And that is a collaboration, because we need to learn from pharma, pharma needs to learn from healthcare system, healthcare systems from tech, and all of us collaboratively working with regulations and regulatory bodies to ensure that the end products are safe. But also we think there is a responsibility because some of the things that can be done, if we can accelerate that, the two weeks example is a great example. It helps patients. It will save your loved ones or my loved ones or someone's loved one. And I think we all are responsible to try to make the whole process very efficient. We had one of the medical device companies with us and they told me, this is one of the biggest ones we partner with, it's impossible for us to innovate because by the time that we start building our technology, by the time that we get all the regulatory, our tech is already arcade. Because the kits and the digitals they use to implement, implant something was very old. So I think there's an opportunity here for all of us to optimize. And I think in the, in the point you mentioned, uh, treatment of every disease starts with actually quantifying that disease, understanding that disease. And for some diseases like Parkinson and Alzheimer, 
there is a really hard path to quantify that. And we think this kind of screening stuff can help. Of course, we have to clinically prove that. In the case of Alzheimer's, there are some publications we have published, but we're still at the very beginning of it. And we would love to invite everyone to help in that sense, because these are the diseases that as we age longer, as Emma mentioned, we're going to all struggle with. And, and any companies that can help, we would love to partner with on that. I think to answer your question directly, we need more regulation in this space. We're, we're already seeing how techniques which have come out of other industries, driven by the, the enormous platforms, are starting to be used in healthcare. And we, we're seeing the evolution of techniques in artificial intelligence, which are not understood. And there needs to be regulation which says, if you're going to use an algorithm within a medical device, you need to understand it and prove it's safe and effective. So maybe I can get a last word on this point. Um, I love this point. I think it's a great one. And let's be really clear. These big ideas, not only do they not have to be independent from clinical validation and outcomes validation, they shouldn't be. There are going to be a dime a dozen cool ideas that come out and then probably a, you know, 50 dozen cool ideas and technologies that come out. Um, we've been very vocal in the digital therapeutics industry of saying clinical evidence and outcomes evidence, true research, um, is critical for differentiating. So I think it's good business on top of the right thing to do. Um, as an example, we've done about a dozen clinical trials, like full up RCT clinical trials. We publish all of them. I think that's what's going to see the differentiation of these cool ideas from, you know, a dime a dozen to the ones that are actually having impact. So it's critical. That's really, really interesting. Um, I'd like to just try and forgive me, get in yeah. just one more question because we're out of time, sadly, but I'd like to take this question. Yeah, there's more one for Lord Drayson. Do you think, um, as Jeremy Corbyn suggests, that um, the state can sort of disrupt um, pharma R&D, you know, with a, a state-based um, R&D organization. Do you think that's feasible? Uh, no, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I do think we do need to evolve the relationship between our industry and society. I, I think that, that I think the evolution of that relationship from what is hitherto a transactional one to more of a partnership one is the future. We're seeing that in lots of industries, and I, th I think that would be a, a very healthy uh, evolution of the, 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 the situation, particularly here in, in the United Kingdom, because of the nature of the National Health Service, um, the way in which that has the complete support of the general public. Um, and so we do need new models, but I, I don't think nationalization is the right model. No, I think, you know, f uh, from my perspective, I think it is also clear that governments could be clearer around what their priorities are, where R&D should focus on. I mean, we saw that, I think, best with the antimicrobial resistance, with the AMR anti-infectives, where there has been a much greater priority. But generally, I think, uh, uh, you know, I think, the only way um, R&D gets steered is through basic research funding, and that is clearly 10, 15 years before you see drugs. I think from an industry perspective, very quick, um, I'm not opposed to the fact that regulation actually can be very helpful in showing us exactly you know, what, what, what's going to be supported. For example, the aggregate summaries that we can now communicate back with participants in studies um, from the EU clinical trial regulation passed in 2014, that has enabled a path forward for better communication with patients, and that's because of the regulation. And it prompted discussion to figure out how to do this in a space where we traditionally haven't shared those results. Great. Well, look, I'm sorry. Sadly, we are out of time. We're going to have to draw this to a close, but I hope you'll join me in thanking our panelists for a great discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much.